What is up, Bitcoiners? It's your boy, CK. And this was a really awesome episode of the Bitcoin Magazine podcast. I had the pleasure of sitting down with Mayor Scott Conger, the mayor of Jackson, Tennessee, and he is doing a lot to push Bitcoin forward, both on a local scale in Jackson, in Western Tennessee, as well as on a national scale, because he is yet another orange-pilled politician, another person to add to, uh, let's call it the army of Satoshi. Uh, but, you know, Scott gets it. Scott understands what, where mining fits into energy production, where sound money fits into both a local, but as well as a personal uh, savings perspective and why the dollar is broken. And he has seen the, you know, he's seen small town America and middle America get hollowed out. And he sees an opportunity for Jackson to become competitive by embracing technology and by embracing Bitcoin. You know, Bitcoin's become completely, uh, I guess the risk uh, harm and ri- the the uh, the career risk that comes from Bitcoin has been completely eliminated. It's pretty obvious. And now Bitcoin's becoming an advantage. Like when you adopt Bitcoin, it, it makes you become more appealing and more competitive, both fiscally as well as uh, from an, an appeal and a marketing perspective. Uh, and I think we're going to see a lot more cities like Jackson, a lot more mayors like Mayor Suarez in Miami and Mayor Scott Conger over here in the smaller city of, of Jackson. Uh, before we get into the podcast, though, I want to tell you guys about the number one Bitcoin event of the year of of history, the biggest one at least, and we're we're shooting for history uh, with Bitcoin 2021 in Miami. Speaking of Bear Suarez, he has rubber stamped this event. He is keen on making Miami a tech hub and a Bitcoin hub. And Bitcoin 2021, maybe future Bitcoin 20, maybe future Bitcoin events. We'll be in Miami. Who knows? Who knows? But you know, Miami is becoming quite the hub of Bitcoin, and it is gonna be a absolute Bitcoin takeover of Miami, June 3rd, 4th, and 5th, Bitcoin 2021, Michael Saylor, Jack Dorsey, Cynthia Lummis, another orange Field politician, Warren Davidson, so many, so many fantastic speakers. I, I can't even get started on the list. Just go to b.tc forward slash conference. Look at the whole list. If they are a big shot Bitcoiner, if they have been doing stuff in the space, they are on our speaker list. That's a fact. It's just like a reality of everyone being at this event. I mean, dare to say 10,000 people are coming to this conference. Like this is going to be the biggest event in America since the Super Bowl. Uh, so I'm really proud of what we're building here. I'm really proud of this event and how it's all coming together. It's coming together in less than a month now. And uh, y'all, you got to be in Miami. This is the bee's knees. There's going to be 50,000, 100,000 people in the city just for Bitcoin, just for crypto. And the conference is going to be absolutely electric. Can't wait to see you there. And uh, yeah, b.tc forward slash conference. Use our sponsor MoonPay to save $400 $400 when you pay with Bitcoin. If you use MoonPay, you can still swipe with your debit card. You can still swipe with your credit card. You can still use Apple Pay, Google Pay, all of that stuff on our website. It's going to give you a free Bitcoin transaction. It's going to send that Bitcoin over to our Bitcoin wallet, and you're going to be able to get a Bitcoin 2021 ticket for $400 off. So, I mean, if you want the best deal for the best conference, You need to go pay in Bitcoin. We want your sats. And if you want to get the best of both worlds, still pay with your credit card and pay us in Bitcoin and get the deal, use MoonPay. The widget is built right into the website. Again, like I said, MoonPay is this awesome technology uh, that enables you to use a debit card, use a credit card, use all this uh, traditional payment infrastructure and send Bitcoin transactions. Uh, It's built into a ton of wallets, over 160, or sorry, over 300 wallets in 160 countries uh, where you can use Apple Pay and have MoonPay send sats to your non-custodial wallet, way better than Coinbase. Like you can't even compare. Uh, It is truly the next step closer to the decentralized future that we are building here with Bitcoin at Bitcoin 2021 with MoonPay leading the way over on the payment infrastructure side of things. Check them all out and enjoy this podcast with Mayor Scott Conger. Bitcoiners, I have quite the treat for you. I'm sitting across the screen from Mayor of Jackson, Tennessee, Scott Conger. Welcome to Bitcoin Magazine Podcast. Thanks for having me, CK. I'm excited to be on. 
So Scott, um, I'm sure all the listeners have read the article that our managing editor wrote about you last week about going into, you know, all of the amazing things that you're kind of doing uh, in your city around Bitcoin mining and Bitcoin adopting Bitcoin in general. Uh, I wanted to get you onto the show just to kind of learn a little bit more about the man uh, behind, you know, the mayor of Jackson and, and kind of just dive into, you know, who you are, how you got in this position and, and, and how you discovered Bitcoin in general. So I'll throw it back to you. You know, why don't you kind of just tell your story? Oh, gosh. Um Man, I, yeah, I've, I've been in Jackson my whole life. Uh, family uh, settled here in 1832. And so uh, we've been here, um, you know, been the mayor since July 1 of 2019. So got my feet uh, under me just in time for COVID to hit. And then uh, I had to experience that this past 14 months. Um, yeah, got a wife who's uh, who's an educator, but stays at home now with our two kids. So daughter will be five this month and son just turned three. Um, so yeah, it's kind of what I am. I'm actually the third person in my, my family to be mayor of Jackson and my great, great, great grandfather back in 1860s. And then uh, my grandfather was mayor from, uh, 1967 to 1989. And so, uh, got elected, uh, city council actually first in 2011, I was at rightful age of 27. When I got elected to the council and, uh, served two terms there and then was fortunate enough to get elected to mayor, uh, two years ago. Incredible, especially around you know the famous the family legacy uh, in in Jackson. I feel like something that really pins or underpins the Bitcoin ethos is this idea of like long term thinking and like building and committing to a place, right? Uh, and I mean, even before we talk about Bitcoin, it's it's clear that at least the Conger family has has done that in Jackson. Yeah, it's it's um, you know, my, my my grandfather was about service and instilled that in me at a young age, and um, you know he was he was part of the junior chamber of commerce, uh, which was used to be really big, and he was the, the national president um, in the early '60s. And, and usually, uh, back then, the the national president would go on to a major company in a major city. Well, he. So I'm, I'm not going to do that. I own a, he owned two businesses here in Jackson and said, I'd, I'd rather be anything in Jackson than, than to leave Jackson. So, um, you know, we're, my family's committed on, on that long-term vision of creating sustainability. And, and that was one of the reasons that, um, that I ran for mayor. Um, like I said, I have two small kids and my wife and I had the conversation about, you know, at that time, less than a one-year-old and a three-year-old of why to go into this, of campaigning, of, of this office and the, the time that it takes. And it was, we want to be part of building something that that our kids, when they graduate high school, college, um, want to come back and want to start their families and build their families here because we've laid that foundation now for them uh, to to have those, whatever industry they want to go into, whatever, whatever jobs, whatever sector that those yep. opportunities are here in Jackson. So I guess, why don't you introduce the listeners to Jackson a little bit? Like, what's Jackson like? And Jackson is um, a, a little big town. How about that? We're we're two hours west of Nashville. We're an hour east of Memphis. So on that Music City Highway, um, you know, a lot of a lot of manufacturing, um, about a 67, 68,000 population. But we're in we're in the middle of West Tennessee, which is mainly rural. And so we serve as the hub. We're known as the hub city. And so on any given day, while our population is 68,000, um, we have 120, 130,000 people in Jackson. That's from people coming to work, um, having their health care here, um, entertainment, you know, shopping, eating, all that is, is centered in Jackson. And so um, we provide that that hub for, for rural West Tennessee and, and uh, our service area, you know, the people coming in is probably closer to half a million, uh, even though our population is, is 68. Gotcha. Okay. That, I think that, that makes a lot of sense. So let's talk about Bitcoin. Like, tell, tell me the story about how you discovered Bitcoin and why you're taking action uh, in your position with Bitcoin. So, it, you know, it's, it was weird. I've, I've been interested um, in, in just kind of trading and, and currency and, and how, to, how to position not only, you know, in my role, myself and my family, um, but how we can constantly looking at how we can position our city in a better financial position for the future. So long, long after I'm gone, 
um, that our, our city and my family is in a better financial position. And so you, you look at Bitcoin and, and it's probably six or eight months ago when we're all at home a lot more than we usually are. And we're all connected a lot more than we have been uh, to the Internet, to social media and start reading articles and 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 hearing things. And then I really got interested. I was watching it was from a distance, watching Mayor Suarez in, in Miami and what he was doing um, and, and really that tech driving the tech industry and, and talking about Bitcoin. And I started looking at it. I thought, man, that is that is so interesting. That is so intriguing. You know, we have some of that here. We, we were the first city in Tennessee to have a gig fiber internet. We just didn't tell anybody and we still don't do a good job of telling people that. But, and so as I'm watching, I'm thinking to myself, yeah, that, that's Miami. Miami's in a different world, right? Than, than a Jackson, Tennessee. And, and how can we, um, I, I don't know if Jackson can do that. And then a friend of mine, local um, Aaron tweeted at me up from one of Mayor Suarez's tweets. And I kind of, if you don't know me, I'm very sarcastic and kind of tweeted back in a sarcastic way about a different coin. I won't go into that. Um, and then, so you kind of see the the Twitter pile on. <laughs> and uh, so that, what it did though, is it opened up a conversation with, with Mayor Suarez and myself on, uh, so we started, you know, shared our phone number, started sending some messages back and forth. And then I started looking and thought, you know, it doesn't have to just be Miami. Uh, so then I, I just jumped in the rabbit hole and uh, I've been going down the rabbit hole ever since of, of what it looks like on, on financial sustainability, financial stability, uh, future planning, um, crafting and creating that vision, that long-term vision of looking in years of how we can better position ourselves, not only as a, a tech hub in the Southeast, um, you know, if we're honest, we'll, we'll, we'll never be a Miami. Um, we don't have an ocean right here at our front door, um, but we, we do have a great opportunity in Jackson to, to enter into that, that that technical technology revolution that I think that we can be a front runner on. And, um, and Bitcoin, I think is, is one of the catalysts to that revolution. Something interesting is, you know, maybe you're going down the rabbit hole after watching what Mayor Suarez has done, but it's interesting to me that in 2021, Bitcoin is seen as an opportunity like a mayor like yourself, whereas like maybe even in 2019, when you first took office, like the reputational weight and kind of damage that would come from kind of front running and being one of the first people to adopt or even advocate for adoption of Bitcoin uh, would have, it, it was a completely different picture. Like, can you talk about like how Bitcoin has kind of made this 180 from like something that's like a bad thing? publicly to like an advantage per se? Well, I think there's still a lot of educational opportunities for people. I think, you know, the, the general public still has some apprehension. Um, I look at it through the, the lens of I'm only guaranteed four years in this office. I'm up for reelection in 2023. Uh, my job is to make sure that I'm doing everything I can to put Jackson in a better position in 2023 than it was in in 2019. Um, Bitcoin wasn't on my radar in 2019, if I'm being honest. Um, I think looking at those, those silver linings of a pandemic and, and requiring us to be in front of screens more, uh, to have conversations, you know, um, I had a, I had a conversation, you know, I was on a meeting earlier this week with someone in California, you're in California right now, uh, you know, if I was before pre-pandemic, the likelihood of us being on a Zoom call, not as great as it is now. It's just that ease of it. And so it allowed that education piece and allow people to be more open to technology. And it's really advanced the entire ecosystem of technology forward probably 10 years than what it would have been on a natural progression because we had to. I know at least at the governmental level, um, it required us to, to look at how we're utilizing technology, how we're implementing technology and then what that looks like going forward. Um, and then you get to, you talk about the inflation that's coming, um, all the, the, the prop up of the federal government for us of stimulus checks, of, um, of PPP, of, of everything that's come out and the, the trillions of dollars that are being spent uh, and the devalue of the dollar. Um, but what has appreciated 
an astronomical amount in the last year. And so it, it really, really hit home to me to start thinking about it, how we can look at it at the governmental level. When I was talking with Aaron, who's, whose day job is in the fencing industry. And so the price of lumber has skyrocketed over the last year. But the, the perspective of it for him was, if I look at it in dollars, yeah, lumber is crazy expensive now, way more expensive than it was last year. But if I look at it in sats, lumber is cheaper than it was last year. And so that appreciating value of Bitcoin, being able to not only reduce the cost of things, um, but to be kind of inflation proof. And I think on the other end of it, how we can help financially empower people because the low barrier to entry, right? I mean, 86% of Americans have a smartphone and it's basically really all you need to get into that world uh, to be able to start using that dollar cost averaging to, to bridge that gap and, and get some appreciating assets so you can start being financially independent and financially empowered. So my next question was going to be, you know, what's your what's your like five minute elevator pitch for Bitcoin? But you kind of just nailed it there. Uh, let, let's talk about like, OK, dollar cost averaging, being financially independent, uh, being banked to, t- to some degree. Like, is that an issue for the people of, of Jackson? Is that something that plagues your your uh your the citizens yeah, I of think the it's, city? It's not unique to us. Right. It, it's it's everywhere. Um when I took office in July of 19, one of the first initiatives that we started was an anti-poverty task force. And uh, this past year, we were one of five cities in the country to be part of uh, the Bloomberg Foundation's Cities for Financial Empowerment. We got the second round of grant funding a few months ago. And so this really just goes along and walks alongside the efforts that we're looking at for financial empowerment. It just gives us another tool to provide that financial empowerment piece of getting people to open their crypto wallet, to utilize whatever they have available, whether it's a dollar, whether it's $2 a day um, of that, of that dollar cost averaging. The key is, and I get, I get sucked into it as well, not looking at the price every five minutes, but just saving, putting that $5, that $2, that $1 away, and just letting it continue to appreciate long-term. Because if you get, if you get sucked in right to the short-term volatility, and it becomes a little scary. You have to you have to step back and look at it in terms of years as opposed to days on what that appreciation can actually do. Would you say it's fair to say that the dollar doesn't work for savings anymore? If you're putting your dollar in a savings account where it's drawing, you know, 0.1% interest annually, um, by the time you're ready to use that dollar, it's going to be worth way less than any any interest rate you, that you have on that, um, you know, a dollar today is not going to buy half as much of what a, a dollar did, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Why is that, why is that bad for America? You think like, what are like the second, third order effects of, of that being the reality that the, the majority of the country is living in right now, the majority of the country uses cash and either they hold cash directly or they're using a, a basic savings account or checking account. Why, why is this detrimental to them? I think because of the inflation rate, even though we, we see it, what we see is 3%, probably really about 25% inflation rate. Um, and you look at people being paid, minimum wage is still what it is. Um, the, the value for our time is still being paid the same. Um, but the cost of living, it keeps, continues to go up. So our time is more valuable. And if you're able to have your appreciating assets to work for you, then it creates a more, a better opportunity for you uh, to do that. But it, it's almost archaic, right? That if you sit back and look at it, uh, being paid, you know, 10, 15, $20 an hour um, for a job that was paying 10, 15, $20 an hour, 10 years ago, you're actually now worth less than you were 20 years ago. So, um, it's it's a system that is devaluing every day and, and not only devaluing the dollar, but also devaluing our time with it. Okay, so one of the big things that caught my eye on the article that Peter wrote was your interest of bringing Bitcoin mining to Jackson, but in order to actually hold those Bitcoins. Like it's almost like you're trying to take a, a, a leverage long position in Bitcoin via mining. 
can you like talk about like what gives you the guts to do that? Because that's it's it's kind of unheard of. Even Mayor Suarez hasn't really pushed that far forward. Well, we we have a lot of work to do to get there. Uh, I had a conversation with our comptroller's office um, last week, and um, I wanted to make sure I was reading the statute right. I was hoping I was wrong, but the statute says no, you can't do that. Um, and so we're going to have to have some legislation change for us to be able to do that. But you know, let, let's look at on a larger scale. If you if you spend you know, fifty thousand dollars on on some mining rigs to be able to generate, you know, just in a dollar comparison today of, of half a million dollars a year of today's value of of Bitcoin. Then, as that continues to appreciate over time, and you hold that on the balance sheet, then you get to a point where, right now, for a municipal government, we're we're having to ask the question: Today, are we paving roads, or are we going to buy a fire truck? Or you're at you're putting or in the question. And I think if we, you know, look 10, 15 years again, I'm trying to set up the city for long beyond when I'm here, um, getting to the point where the city officials can say, let's and, let's pave roads and get a fire truck. Let's do this and, let's do the fun things and do the things that we need to do. And um, I think for what governments spend on items and things, um, it's a relatively low cost that has a huge return on investment. Is, that, is there anything that the city of Jackson is doing today to try to set itself up uh, for the future? Or is it really just relying on kind of like tax revenue uh, and other forms of just like traditional um, government income? Yes, that's where we are right now. I think it's where a lot of governments are, are stuck in. And so we've, you know, we're getting together a, a blockchain task force. And really with the first two things that they're going to be tasked with um, is to help us with an RFP and, um, create a, an opportunity for for our city employees to to do some conversion of their paycheck. So we would still pay them in U.S. dollars, um, but give them a almost a deferred compensation opportunity, much like we do for for IRAs. So they can get paid and they can do a direct um, payroll deduction for a, a crypto Bitcoin conversion. Um, and so that's we're going to get that together. And then the second piece will be. You know, what does legislation look like? What do, who do we need to bring to the table? How do we need to start having those conversations? Because in Tennessee, you know, our legislative session is from January to April, May, sometimes June. And so you got to have that ready before next January. And so who do we need to bring? Who do we need to talk to about getting legislation prepared so that, that cities can actually do that and hold uh, Bitcoin on their on our balance sheet, uh, local governments? And um, you know, it's it's going to take a collaborative effort to do that, um, but we have to we have to start doing start looking at that, and and so we can better prepare ourselves for the future. Makes sense. Um, so, I guess my question is like, you know, I'm sure there's been a- other opportunities to differentiate Jackson in the past. Like, what about Bitcoin, and what about kind of like taking Mayor Suarez's playbook, like? What about it makes you feel like comfortable in pushing it forward uh, in general or, or more specifically? Yeah, I think it's there's several things there. You know, if, if we're looking at being actually what I think Jackson can be is, is that tech community because we're, we're well positioned. Um, you know, we're on an interstate. We have rail access, you know, the basic infrastructure for basic, you know, what we know of industry. Uh, you can fly anywhere in the world. Uh, from Jackson, Tennessee. Uh, we have an airport here as well. But what we haven't done in the past well is tell our story and, and differentiate ourselves. And I said we were the first gig internet fiber network infrastructure in Tennessee. We didn't tell anybody. And Chattanooga told people first. So now they're the first. Whether it's true or not, they because they told people they're the first. So um, we need to be able to capitalize on our existing infrastructure um, to to bring people into Jackson so that we can, you know, whether it's, whether it's through Bitcoin mining efforts or whether it's getting people who, because people who are have gone down the rabbit hole and look at Bitcoin as a, a true viable option for the future are, are more interested in those tech opportunities as well. And so that creates a, an entire different economy for Jackson for the future. 
Yeah, uh, again, what you're kind of bringing up is it's almost like you want to help Jackson be more competitive and you want to, you know, maybe even it's because of COVID and everyone kind of going remote and it kind of breaking the shackles to one specific geography for work that that's created an environment where now, at least in the U.S., people are have some more optionality and they might want to look to a small town like Jackson that has great connectivity uh, in interstate, you know, two hours from Nashville, all that good stuff, just like you're saying. And, you know, in this new kind of paradigm, there's the opportunity for a city like Jackson to even compete and, and pull people away from Miami. Can you just talk about, like, this idea of, like, even, like, jurisdictional competition or city competition and, and this new paradigm where, you know, mayors are almost, like, starting to, like, compete to bring in talent yeah, and that 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 is the absolute competition is the, is not not going out and landing the industry that's not the competition um, having the talent and the workforce and that talent competition to, to bring folks here you know what we've seen in, in all honesty of of mid-sized cities throughout the country um, especially those that are surrounded by rural areas has been a brain drain um, people who go off to college or people who go to college and those those jobs that they want, those 21st century jobs that, that we all talk about, um, they're going there. Um, and so I think decentralizing the the workforce and not requiring, you know, if, if you want to work at a specific company, you don't have to necessarily be there now. You can work remotely. Um, you know, we're talking to companies now that they only are going to require if they if they land in Jackson. They're only going to require half their workforce to be on site. The other half can work remotely throughout the country. And so, um, we are not in just a, a national competition for talent and for people. I think it's it's a global one as well. Isn't that better for for citizens in general? Do you think that this is a better dynamic? The competition is is I love it. Uh, you know, some people you know want to just stomp out competition. I, it gets me excited. It, you know, create, it causes you to think creatively, um, to utilize your strengths, to, to identify, to do that constant SWOT analysis of what you can improve on, especially as a city, uh, as an organization, on how you can compete. Um, you know, we're, we're competing at high levels every single day, and, and we all have to, to do that uh, to make sure of, of long-term sustainability and success. I love I love hearing a mayor of the city actually acting that way, because, I mean, at least being here in California, it's not necessarily the the tone that we get at, uh, at mayoral uh, announcements and such like that. Listen, I was I was by all uh, conventional wisdom was not supposed to win this race. I was at the outraised five to one. Uh, and you know, part of what I did was utilizing technology, utilizing social media utilizing that eight cent CPM on direct advertising on social media to, to win a race that, um, that some people had me out of before I ever started. So, um, I, I love, it. I love competition. I love thinking people thinking that it's not going to work. Um, and just grinding. That's just what I do. And, what, what, and using technology, yeah, technology forward to win. Uh, I mean, I, I think it's truly powerful. I'm curious if you've heard of this book or read this book. I've heard of it. I haven't, I haven't gotten it yet. The Sovereign Individual. I would love to mail you a copy of this. I have like three copies. I think it's pretty tough to get on Amazon these days. Okay. Uh, but I would love to mail you one written in 1990 or published in 1997. So written before then and uh, predicted uh, digital hard e-cash um, as well as the uh, global uh, jurisdictional competition that would arise from uh, from the Internet. So uh, very directionally correct. And I feel like it would uh, absolutely do a, a you know, uh, an enormous amount uh, transferring some knowledge over to you. Oh, yeah, that'd be great. I'd love to have a copy. Yeah, awesome. Well, I mean, uh, Scott, this has been a great conversation. I feel like you really kind of like understand like the key points of like why Bitcoin is good for your city, what is happening, you know, globally and and uh, and you're acting on it, which is, is really awesome. I'm kind of curious, like, what have been the most interesting conversations that have kind of emerged since you started this initiative uh, to really try to, you know, make Jackson a more competitive place? Yeah, so I think the most interesting thing is the conversations, you know, when you talk about doing stuff like this, it's not, it's the amount of the community, worldwide community that reaches out and just wants to have those conversations. And for me, 
it's uh, it's just been about absorbing as much information as possible and, and trying to make those decisions and, and how we can move forward on things. Um, but man, you know, then, then talking with people that, you know, locally that I've known for my whole life, like, you know what, I've been, I've been doing Bitcoin since 2018. Like, you never told me. And so getting to have those new conversations with people and then, and then connecting with people from all over the world on, on this and, and getting that information. And every time I talk with somebody, they're, they're talking about a new book and I'm writing it down and, and just trying to get that information and absorb as much as possible. And it just, it's actually exciting and enthralling. And it's sometimes I have to back up because it can be kind of all consuming and, um, you know, get home and like I said, I have two small kids and it's six 30 and eat. I'm like, Hey, don't y'all need to go to bed? I got some, some of this book I need to read. Are y'all tired yet? And so it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's been incredible. And it's, it's, um, it just gets more exciting every day. Awesome. Well, this is my last question for you, but I'm curious, like in your mind, what do people get most wrong about Bitcoin? I don't necessarily think that, that they get the most wrong. I think it's the the viewpoint and the perspective of it is because we, we have a tendency at first to look at the the short term volatile swings. And so, um, it, it, you know, I, I get it to an extent, but some extent, I think, you know, we look at the stock market, man, that thing swings all the time. But uh, if you look at individual stocks, but that short term volatility scares people away. And so they, they still think it's, it's not valid. It's, it's not going to happen. It's not something that can, can be a, a true legitimate alternative or even be a replacement for, for currency uh, because of that short term volatility. And then you, you start telling them to take a step back and look at the long term appreciation of where it's come. And then you start talking about 21 million. That's it. There's not, you can't fabricate anymore. You can't print any more off. Uh, if you get into, you know, governments can't get in a bond and just start printing it off um, to to falsely prop up an economy. Um, it, the manipulation value is, is virtually non-existent on manip- manipulating the currency. Um, there really is no short elevator pitch on the education piece, but continue to have those conversations about, I get it. Uh, I get you see the, the large swings daily. Um, but if you step back and, and just got to look at the big picture, there's a lot of trees in that forest, but you got to step back and look at the forest and not get locked in and, and focused on a tree. Um, and that's hard to do. I mean, I, I get it. It's hard for some people to see because they're, they're worried about their short-term volatility. Um, and then I think on the other side of it, the um, economic, the uh, environmental impact of it. And so, you know, what we looked at on, on how to use some of our burn off from, from landfills on just having conversations with uh, some of our, with our energy authority folks on, burn off from our landfills, how we can how can be more clean. And then utilizing peaks and valleys of energy load for our energy authority on, on mining efforts. If we want to bring some commercial mining in um, and use some, utilize some of our buildings that we have here, they want to rent it and renovate it or whatever, uh, but attracting those commercial miners in and then being a, a benefit to our local energy authority because they can better regulate and plan on their energy load and their energy capacity instead of having to do peaks and valleys of their of their energy purchase from TVA. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I think that, um, you know, one of the mis- most under- misunderstood things about Bitcoin is the Bitcoin mining and the proof of work aspect is, you know, they just a lot of people, their base assumption is Bitcoin is is a worthless craze. Oh, and it takes a lot of electricity. But they're not really saying, okay, Bitcoin is better money. And guess what? The fact that it uses electricity could actually be beneficial in uh, grid balancing, uh, in finding and and taking advantage of stranded resources. Uh, you know, improving and ruthlessly becoming more efficient at energy capture. These are, you know, fantastic kind of side effects that come from Bitcoin mining. But like you mentioned, it's, you know, these are this, these are like the layers that most people, they just, they never get to. They stay surface level. Well, I think, I think because everything about Bitcoin challenges the status quo and that creates a extreme level of uncomfort for people that are comfortable in the status quo. And so I think that's, that's part of it. If, if the conversations are directed into energy, um, to not a real currency, to, to things like that, when I think the, the, the basis of it is 
it's not what I'm used to. It's change. It's scary. It's not the status quo. And it, it challenges every, every conceptual idea I have about economy and currency and energy consumption. And it makes me very uncomfortable. I think it's really what it is. And we try to pick it apart because we are uncomfortable with it because it challenges so much of conventional wisdom of what we've been taught our entire lives. Yeah, no, again, uh, I feel like we should have started off with that question because I feel like there's something very deep about the fact that Bitcoin challenges conventional wisdom. Like everything we do today, it seems like it's kind of like pinned on this like conventional wisdom that's been drilled into our heads for this last 20 years. And at least for me in 2017, discovering Bitcoin, it was like, whoa, like yeah. this this breaks everything. Um, yeah, go back to you. I, I think the, the, the opportunity though is we've had our conventional wisdom challenge so much this last year. Um, you know, we thought that we had to go into a retail store to buy things. We thought that we had to go to the grocery store and there wasn't delivery services. You know, conventional wisdom has been challenged and we've seen adaptations to, to the retail market, to how we consume goods and services. And so, um, you know, at one point, a streaming service was a radical idea. Uh, to watch, to get entertainment. At one point, that was radical. I mean, Netflix was sending you stuff in the mail uh, because Blockbuster was never was going to continue to be king, and um, Blockbuster is uh, fiat currency, I think, and and then streaming services are Bitcoin. I love that. I mean, there's many analogies uh, that you can make, uh, but that that that's certainly a strong one. And yeah, I'm I'm excited for Bitcoin to disrupt. Uh, you know, fiat, you know, this kind of currency by decree. Uh, but until then, you know, we'll have to just watch and see what happens. Uh, Scott, this has been fantastic getting to chat with you. Um, thanks so much for coming on the show. I want to give you a chance to give our audience, the Bitcoin Magazine audience, uh, your last word. Oh, man, no, it's, uh, I appreciate you having me on today. And it's, it's, it's been exciting. I think it's going to continue to be exciting for, for us and for me in, in Jackson, Tennessee. And, uh, you know, we want to you know, we don't want to take anybody's place in the world, but we want to create our own place in the world. And I think that um, looking at a, the, the digital revolution that is here and is continuing to come down the road, uh, we're well positioned to to be a part of that and to be a leader in that. And that's what we want to do. We want to make sure that we're we're welcoming to to those, and uh, we're looking every day on how we can improve. And my goal as as mayor of the city is to when I go to bed at night that I made Jackson just a little bit better than it was when I woke up. And uh, that's, that's the consistent goal. And that's what we're going to continue to do and, and find ways and creative ways to do that. All right. Awesome. Well, again, I, I love that you're trying to do that with Bitcoin. I hope that just like Mayor Suarez inspired you, that you inspire other mayors, uh, other mayors in Jackson, other, or sorry, other mayors in Tennessee, other mayors across the country. And uh, yeah, I would love to just see Bitcoin continue to uh, to push through and become more and more uh, accepted throughout uh, society and, and throughout government. Um, for all the listeners, you guys can find me at CK underscore Snarks. Uh, I guess, Scott, I forgot to give you a chance to kind of plug yourself. Where can people uh, learn more about you, your city, and and, oh, and uh, follow you? Uh, Twitter is uh, Mayor Conger. I think uh, Instagram is, is Mayor Scott Conger. And then... Uh, Mayor Scott Conner, I think, is on Facebook as well. JacksonTN.gov is our, our city website, and you can find us on all those uh, all those social media platforms at uh, City of Jackson TN. And um, yeah, we're um, we're pushing forward every day and communicating. You know, my role as as mayor and, and when I ran was transparency, efficiency, and inclusivity. And uh, that's um, that's what we we do every day. We try to communicate and be as transparent as possible and include as many people and drive efficiency in everything that we do. You love to hear it. All right, cool. Well, hey, to the Bitcoiners out there, go give Scott some love. Go blow up his Twitter. He's he's rocking some laser eyes. Uh, so sure. he, he obviously knows what he's talking about when it comes to Bitcoin. And we're excited to have you uh, on the Orange Pilled team, Scott, for sure. Uh, right. Yeah, and, and again, to the listeners, go follow Bitcoin Magazine. Go give us those five-star reviews. Share this show. You know the drill. Peace.